Hello and welcome back, you beautiful, beautiful people. Uh, if you remember in the last episode, which you probably did if you're watching this one, uh, I ended it by doing a weird cut-in from the future, so hello again, it is future me, as per the recording anyway, so it's past me for you, but future me for recording me. It's all very wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff, but anyway, um... We're going to cut in right where we left off uh, from the last episode in the Blender tutorial section. You can look up Blender tutorials and things like that. I'll go through it in this video. And uh, yeah, thanks for checking out the last one. Thank you for checking this one out. And uh, please enjoy the video. Like, um, set up Blender to uh, use STL. And it'll be an import-export functionality of Blender. So... You can go to all 3DP, I guess, or the Blender manual, which is probably the better place to go. So in this case, I'm going to go file, import, and I have an STL file here. I know that I'm in downloads here, and I went to the signet ring, files, signet ring, STL, and we'll import that in. Now, it looks like this part did not come in. We can see the signet ring in our Explorer, our scene collection over here. Boom, there it is. Uh, I still don't know how to get this thing centered on this thing. <laughs> so, oh well. It doesn't matter. Uh, the, the fact of ma the matter is, though, we've got this ring. And we are going to modify it slightly. So we've got this nice flat top. Um, I don't know what size ring this is. I don't know how it'll fit. Uh, but it's small enough, it really shouldn't matter. Uh, so the first thing that I, I'm going to do is, I think I'm going to add just a letter to the top. It doesn't have to be fancy or great, but we can take a look at what fonts we've got. We want to go add, and we want to go text. We're going to bump that over. And it's not very big. And that's okay. Because we're going to hit our S key, as in Steven, and that will allow us to scale. You can also use... The scale button over here and we're in object mode here that means that we're not editing anything yet but we can hit tab by default to open edit we're gonna go s why s because uh and then over here i think we can i guess it would be under font you know the the brilliant thing about being a, uh, a youtuber is that i i kind of exist sometimes uh is b font the only one that exists Oh god, nice. Uh, there we go. And then we'll go back to object mode and scale it up. This is in fact a uh, Comic Sans of a type. Uh, hey, of a type. <laughs> Alright, but this is a, a text, and we don't want text. We want this to be a mesh. That'll be a 3D object like this. So we can right click and convert to mesh. And then... Since we're here, uh, in order to move, I guess I should tell you that basic. Uh, you use your middle mouse button to move uh, your view. Or you can use uh, these here. Like this little pip here allows you to rotate around. This hand lets you pan. Um, I don't like messing with the others. Uh, there's zoom. But you can scroll up and down to zoom in for zoom. Uh, scroll up for zoom in. Scroll out. Scroll down for zoom out. Jeez. Uh, if you want to rotate around your canvas like this, like you would with your pips, uh, you just hold down middle mouse button to rotate. If you want to pan, hit and hold shift. I think I don't think it matters. It does not matter which shift key. But you hit and hold shift, and it will let you pan. So, fancy. Uh, if you have a numpad or a number pad, like a 10 key, uh, that will do different things too, like change your view, which is incredibly useful um, at different times. But uh, anyway, so we have this S here in Comic Sans because I love pissing people off sometimes. Uh, but now it's a mesh because we've converted it to a mesh. Now we want to move to edit mode and we want to extrude, uh, extrude the region. But we need to make sure we're selected. None of this is selected. It's all black. So we want to make sure that we are selecting all of these. If this were a 3D mesh like the ring is... Right now, in order to select all of our vertices, which are these little itty-bitty dots, um, they're a point of interest. It's a vertice as in the direction is going to change at some point, or it is a subdivision of the object. Uh, we then can click on this little transparency button, and it will allow us to see through the object, quote-unquote. 
uh, to grab all of the vertices. But we are on a two-dimensional object, a plane, P-L-A-N-E, and that will allow us to select all of them without having that transparency on. But we want to extrude, and that will give us this little, little duder here. And we can just click and drag upward, and that gives us this solid three-dimensional shape. Now we can go back to object mode. We have a three-dimensional shape. Now we want it on the uh, we want it on this thing. Sorry, I had to change my camera because that perspective was throwing me off. So now we just literally use those pips, that blue one to move it vertically, the uh, the red one to move it laterally, and then the the green one to move it uh, I guess depthily. Uh, it looks like our S is going to be just a little bit too uh, too big, so we can hit our scale button again, our S button. Scale it down, and we can move this into place uh, in a nice centered place. That that should be fine. But you'll notice that we have quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of space here. So I hit the one on my uh, on my ten key, my number pad, to get to this view here, and that's very useful. I don't know how to do it without the num pad. I apologize. Um, we can check our center. We're a little off center. Whoops, arrow keys don't do what they do in Photoshop. So we're going to bump it into center. And then we're going to drop it down. I don't want a ton of rays on this. But that, that looks pretty decent for as good as uh, an italic Comic Sans can. We're going to click it again and bump it up just a little bit. And I think that looks pretty good. So that's going to be our STL file, or th that's going to be our blend file now. Now we want to export it as an STL. So we go to File, Export, and again, you'll need to set up the plugin or the add-on for STL. We'll go to Downloads. That's not what I wanted. Uh, Signet Rain. And drop it in here. Export. And now you'll see it right there. And we can drop that into our FlashForge 3D printing software. Have y'all ever noticed that I talk, like, a lot? Because I have many times in my life realized that. I apologize that this episode is going on for so long, but there's a lot of material to cover here to kind of set our foundational base, uh, and I appreciate you sticking with it. Uh, we are just about to get into the actual 3D printing, not just the modeling and stuff like that, so uh, feel free to watch the next episode. That should be coming out real soon. Thanks so much for watching this one, and until next time, have a good one. Hello and welcome back. This is episode 3 of the 3D Printing a Signet Ring series. Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, in the last episode, real quick recap, we talked about some Blender stuff, navigating Blender, and importing slash exporting STL files. So just so you know, we are now into the actual 3D printing aspect, and if you have already done the other two things in the past and you're just looking at the 3D printing side of things with the FlashForge Adventurer 3, this is the video for you. This is the actual 3D printing side of things. So if you're interested in that, please continue on. Otherwise, I've got a number of other videos you might be interested in. So go check those out. Uh, until then, though, please enjoy the rest of this video. Thanks so much. 
So this is going to use a lot of the same functions that you will find with uh, Blender. But the pips and things like that are relegated pretty much entirely to the mouse. So to pan around in this one, it's a little bit different. Um, they're all familiar enough controls uh, on the mouse. But they're, they're just slightly different because why not, right? Uh, so to pan around, you use your middle mouse button. To rotate, you use your right click and hold. Uh, and then you can drag around. And then if you want to zoom in and zoom out, it's the scroll wheel once again. But from here, we can just grab our files, our signet ring specifically, with our initial. And it's loading it upside down. Uh, and the reason they're doing that is because of support material. So support material is an important thing to take into account because it's going to put stuff right along our S. So what is support material? It is a, uh, it's essentially chaff. Uh, if you think like scaffolding, uh, when buildings are constructed or like skyscrapers or, or when they're putting siding on larger or taller houses, um, they use scaffolding specifically because uh, it allows for them, it allows for construction workers to build things on an overhang um, before everything is perfectly structurally sound. So the 3D printing software will allow you to try to print this, but it's going to end up screwing up because you have all these little tiny layers right here. And I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Notice too that we have some geometry here whoops, we're very zoomed in, some geometry here that's kind of crushed out that we didn't see in Blender. Oh, we did. We actually did see it in Blender. It was just very small. That That's due to the way that the, the artist went through and rendered out the ring. It's fine. Um, but if you are noticing stuff like that, it could be some artifacting from the conversion. Uh, sorry, bud. I can't help you out much with that. Uh, but anyway, so we've got this We've got this gap here, this space. So you've got this S facing downward, but then you've got this this overhang, this plateau or inverted plateau. So in order to be able to print that appropriately, we need to be able to put material underneath along this S. And I'll show you exactly what that looks like. Um, we're also going to be putting what's known as a raft uh, underneath that. And it's really simple to do. Most 3D printing software has it built in. Uh, and I can actually show you the individual layers that it will look like as we print it. Um, I'll try to do a time lapse uh, if I can, if I have the means to do so. Um, time lapses are a little bit difficult with my current setup, but I'll, I'll see what I can do. I'll try. Um, you'll see it right about not right now, because <laughs> I'm going to show you this first. Uh, but you'll you'll see it sometime in this video if I can get it working for us. Uh, we're going to add these supports here. Actually, you know what? It, it's easier if I do the start slicing now. So the reason I'm showing you the slice is because the software is going through and dividing this up into paper-thin layers. Uh, 0.04 millimeters per layer, I believe, is what it is. Uh, but we can look at the slice preview. And this is what we are going to see. I mean, not the colors specifically, but this is what the individual layers will look like as it's printing. So this is a particularly low fidelity uh, print that I've got selected for the time being. That's fine. It doesn't need to be fancy, like I said. But we can play with these sliders here, like the layers slider. If I slide this down, you can see that the part starts to disappear. But what's cool is you can see what happens and how the part is actually going to be made as we print. So I have it set to a honeycomb fill specifically. The first few layers are full fills, but we'll get there in a second. First, I want to start with this. This is the raft. So the first little bit of this is raft material. And you won't see, yeah, this. This is the raft. This is chaff material. This will be thrown away. You don't use this material for anything other than consistency of the part because this will absorb some of the imperfections of your build plate uh, bubbles or scratches or scrapes or what have you um, that can be absorbed by this this raft uh, this red square this red box you see around it this is an extrusion cleaning line so this is essentially if you have any gunk or any leftover material on the nozzle from the previous time you printed uh, this this line essentially cleans up any of that curly cue 
uh, kind of gross, junky looking stuff, and it prevents it from getting into your build a little bit better. Because uh, not everything needs to have a raft or support material. Um, it's really nice when it doesn't because then it, it's less plastic, right? Um, so we're going to go up a couple of layers. And you can see the first thing that we're going to print is our S. Well, that's a problem. Do you know why that's a problem? That's a problem because... Oh, that's weird. It rendered it backwards. That's really weird. Uh... But the reason that that's a problem is because we have all this space here and we know there's going to be ring around this. So I can already see it in layer number nine. Layer number nine is going to have problems because all this plastic, all this molten hot 455 degree Fahrenheit plastic is going to just droop down onto this raft bed, right? So that's that's a problem. We want to get rid of that. But let's let's just you can see this honeycomb structure this honeycomb structure is incredibly strong it's what i've used in all of my parts uh it's essentially a bunch of uh triangular dependencies on each other so uh, even though these are hexagons uh, much like honeycomb um they uh they they hold up because all of the angles lead into one another and they are geometrically solid they are nested and it fits very lovely because they uh, in any direction, they apply pressure to each other and distribute that pressure throughout the interior of the part. It's very structurally sound. Uh, what you'll see here, this ugliness here, is probably going to show up in the ring, not with the colors specifically, um, but the, this ugliness will show up to a degree in the ring, and typically with that kind of thing, you can either get a higher resolution print or you can just post-process it and sand it out. Um, I leave most of my settings defaulted um, because I don't know what all of them do. And then we'll, we'll finish out the ring at the top there. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I leave most of my settings defaulted with a couple of key differences. And I'll talk about those briefly. Um, yeah, uh, support material though. We go to this little icon here and hit supports. And you have a couple of options. You have tree-like and you have linear or pillar. I don't use trees very often because they haven't done much for me. They haven't served me well because, again, these are like trunks of trees. They're cylindrical. And 3D printers don't tend to do cylinders that well, especially when we're talking about a pillar size of 1.5 millimeters. That's very, very shallow or very, very low in diameter. And so... It's very, very, very small, and the extruder tends to, especially at length, the extruder tends to start to knock it over or break it off and stuff, so we don't really care about that too much. Um, I guess in this way, they're doing it in three millimeter. I should have clicked on this first, but these are these are still fairly small, and they're still pretty easy to break, so we'll, I like doing pillars. Pillars are pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, we only want them on... Uh, on build structures that are 55 degrees or greater, so uh, not 45 degree angles that are you know steep, but these are going to be even steeper than that because these 3D printers can actually usually print on up to a 50 degree angle without too much of an issue. So um, 55, I think, is what the software defaults to, and pillar size at 1.5 millimeters, perfect. Uh, that's the way that I've done it. And then I do auto supports, and you'll see this. Why this? Because this is all the chaff material that you're going to see when we print. I don't know why it bounced me back out of that, but whatever. Um, so these are just little pillars that will be printed, and they're actually accordion-shaped when they're printed. And then you see a whole bunch of them down here now. So now when we go to start slicing, uh, I'll talk about my settings here in a minute. Slice preview. So now you'll see that they show up a little bit better and we can bring our slices down a little bit further. You can see this accordion shape that we'll have. Uh, these are not structurally sound. They're strong enough and uh, able well enough to hold up our material as needed, but they are meant to be broken out and broken off. Uh, underneath as well, uh, let's, uh, let's get down here. You'll see the zigzags here as well and that's just enough to uh, to offset the uh, the S and the signet that we've got, and that will let us build 
our ring base on there without having any gaps that are uh, worrisome. So that's that's good. Now, uh, real quick, those settings I was talking about, uh, there are a couple that you want to pay attention to, especially when picking out a 3D printer because not all software is created equal. Um, when we go to slice this, um, I'm going to make a change real quick. Start slicing. Uh, you want to have something that has a very comprehensive setup uh, for, for variables. Flash Forge did not have a very good one uh, originally. So I actually have the Flash Forge 4 software here. It takes a second to boot up. But this, when you add something to this, like the Signet Ring. Come on. Just, just do what I tell you. There we go. So notice it didn't populate on the bottom or uh, upside down. That's because the other software just interprets that this is the best angle to print from, which is good. Um, I said I don't love it earlier. It's because I'm dumb. Uh, but this one did as well. Okay. So this auto-generated this structure. Ah, geez, oh, Pete, it's so finicky. Uh, and then structures underneath. And then it's just like, oh, yeah, we can print the rest, no problem. Cool, right? Uh, well... The, the problem is when you go to actually print this, here are all your options. That's, that's all your options. You don't have a ton to work with. There's not a whole lot of good offsets here. So uh, this new Flash Forge software is a lot better. It's a lot more complicated, though, and it takes a lot more understanding, uh, which I had to do a lot of Googling for. Um, so in this particular... Uh, screen. I don't do with anything for the actual part. I don't mess with anything. I could, if you wanted to make something that was much stronger, you can up your fill density. Uh, you can also change your shape. So you could have it true triangles, or you could have a 3D infill or lines or whatever. I leave it on hexagons. 20% fill density is fine for almost everything that I need. Uh, but I get into supports and raft, and I change the space to model, which is the actual supports that zigzag. Uh, the space between those and the sides of the model. So if we're talking this particular part, come on, mouse. Uh, we're talking about the, the distance between this here and actually, I think you saw it probably best. I'll, I'll show you in a minute. I'll show you what space to model is um, for the XY as well as for the Z. Um, and I, I upped this just a, a couple of notches because it was 0.2. This was... I, just a single up for each of these. That's fine. The raft, though, I did bump up to the maximum it would allow me, I think. Uh, yeah, 40 or 0.4 millimeters. Uh, and this space to model for the raft is important because this makes it much easier to remove the raft from the model itself. Um, that, that's incredibly important because if you don't do that, you can get some really nasty raft stickage and it has ruined a number of the parts I've tried to make because uh, if, I, if I didn't use a, a utility knife, um, then, uh, it would, it would break the part. Uh, and fun fact, uh, because I didn't know about this and I was using the old software before, um, I actually was using a utility knife to clear off one of a part, one of my parts. And I, uh, sliced open, uh, my finger across my middle knuckle on my left index finger. And, uh, that, um, nicked a tendon and then, uh, it, it's, getting better and it's healing slowly but uh, that tendon does not like to bend properly anymore it, it will bend but it is much more painful and much more tight so be careful don't use a utility knife uh if you do use cut gloves uh don't be like me uh but an invaluable set of tools are uh large toenail clippers and um uh a pair of really nice durable tweezers those are two of my must-have tools for this, as well as the tools that came with my 3D printer. One for cleaning the nozzle slash extruder and an Allen wrench to take it apart and put it together and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, so those are pretty much the, the only settings that I really changed. You can change your extruder temperature and your platform temperature if you want to. Uh, so I actually have this set to 100 degrees and 230 degrees. That's fine. They have some presets for different kinds. Uh, if you're more environmentally conscious, uh, conscious and you don't necessarily want the part to last forever or you don't need it to last forever, you can look into buying PLA plastic, which runs at different temperatures. But this is a uh, plant filament 
a plant-based filament rather than a petroleum-based filament. ABS is going to be stronger and it doesn't degrade in sunlight. Uh, plant, uh, I don't know what the PLL stand, PLA stands for, but uh, the, the PLA itself does degrade over time in the sunlight. Um, anyway, I leave the rest of this pretty well. Uh, oh, cooling fan control, I have it set to always on because I want, so I want that raft to be as cool as possible before I start building on top of it. So that adds that extra layer of, um, uh, of difference or that, that oxidation uh, on the top layer between my actual part, and it makes it easier to remove. Uh, I don't think I've adjusted anything else, though. I don't think so. This is a lot of information very quickly, but you can always rewind if you need to, need to catch anything. Um, and I recognize that we're at 46 minutes or so uh, unedited in my record time. But anyway, uh, so we, we'll go to our slice preview. And you'll see this, uh, this gap between my print or my uh, raft material, or not raft, uh, support material, this blue, uh, and this tan, my actual part. There's a gap right here throughout all of the lines of my support material, that is that space to model. That, that's the gap th that we adjusted there. And then uh, we, we added some, some space between our raft and our part itself. So uh, you won't be able to see that rendered too well here, but you can see some of it <sighs> right, uh, right there. You can see a little bit of that spacing. That just, it, it's so, microscopic it, it's hard to see i doubt you'd be able to see much of it without like being very careful about seeing it uh, and looking for it when you actually print your part so we'll go back up and we'll take a look at this and we can close our preview actually uh, under our slice preview you can see all this information over here so you have your file name but you also have the estimated print time and the estimated material and that's how i'm actually calculating the cost of my material in my my program that i wrote very easy calculation uh, nothing fancy just needs a couple of input parameters that our software already gives us and we are spitting out what it would cost for this um but anyway and you can look up all your parameters all the major parameters and things like that um but this will take about an hour to print so for even though it's a small print this is still a, uh, a significant effort, and it's something worth noting that it will take time uh, because it takes time for the plastic to run. We don't want it to go uh, too fast or too slow because it will stretch or it will uh, constrict the plastic. Uh, we want it to run at just the right speed, and you can play with a little bit of that, but you don't want to do too much uh, because you can get some really funky effects with it. Uh, maybe if you're a really creative artist, you can use that to your advantage. I, however, am not one of those individuals. So, that being said, this is uh, the signet ring that I do plan on printing. I'm actually going to, uh, I can't in there, uh, save this as my download signet ring files. And then my FPP is going to be my Flash Forge print preset, I believe is what it stands for. I could be wrong. Don't quote me. Uh, yeah, so then what we'll do is, uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll be able to start printing this and get it, getting it look looking quite nice, um, but I will hopefully get a time lapse, dot, 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 question mark. You'll see that right about now.
So there you have it. Uh, that's really all it takes to be a 3D printer, I, I, I guess, to, to have a 3D printer. <laughs> I, uh, I do this a lot. I do this stuff a ton. I don't make a whole lot of stuff myself. Uh, like I said in the very beginning of the first episode of this brief series, or this mini-series, uh, a lot of what I do is copied from projects from Thingiverse or um, other similar websites. So uh, I hope that doesn't bother you. If it does, uh, get used to being on the internet, I guess. Um, also, I'm not selling these things, so whatever. That said, uh, there's a ton more that we could go into on how to 3D print, how to 3D model, how to do all kinds of things with this. Um, for instance, as you can see on your screen right now, there's this ring with a Comic Sans S on it, and the background of that S looks really funky. Um, it looks really kind of jagged and, and weird. Uh, you can take a rotary tool. Uh, some people know them as Dremel tools, but a rotary tool and sand that down if you don't have one of those. Uh, there are a number of files. There are a number of other tools that you can use. Uh, another thing for ABS plastic specifically is if you have nail polish remover, uh, the acetone will actually help uh normalize some of this so it will actually melt the plastic and then when you wipe it off it will actually start to settle and set in a more even way or in a more even surface so that would be another thing worth doing or investigating on a side piece that you don't care about so that you can get a feel for uh side piece you don't care about is a terrible joke <laughs> on a, a piece that is not a production piece um so that you can get a feel for how the acetone interacts with the particular blend of plastic that you are using um just as a, a heads up there so thanks so much for watching this if you have questions throw them in the comments there's a lot of information over the last three videos that i've had that could be really easy to skip over or miss or have trouble with so if you're curious uh, please, again, throw it in the comments. If you liked this mini-series, you know the deal. Like, comment, subscribe, the whole deal. Let me know what you liked about it specifically, what you think I could do a little bit better. Uh, please be nice. Uh, I'm a sensitive I'm a sensitive soul, though I seem thick-skinned. Disney, please don't nail me. <laughs> uh, but if... If you are interested in seeing more 3D printing stuff, please let me know if you're interested in seeing me do uh, post-processing on pieces like this, how I do it, uh, which, by the way, is not super often because usually the stuff is just for me. Uh, let me know. I would also be willing to make a video on that. Again, thanks so much for watching, and until next time, have a good one.